Special thanks goes to our gold sponsor, Accenture. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Sander Spice. And during this talk, I'm going to take you all down the WebAssembly rabbit hole. But before I start, I want to thank Patrick, Nick, and Andrea for organizing this conference, because I've been joking and subtly hinting at this conference for now almost two years. And to actually see it happening, and to see the community come together here, it's really exciting. So, who am I? Like I said, I'm Sanders Spice. I work as a contractor. I mean, in my day job, I just use JavaScript. Um, so, I got into OCaml at the, at the end of 2015. So, the reason why I, why I went for OCaml uh, back then was that uh, I was using React, I was using JavaScript, and there were certain limitations that I was running into uh, that, that you are probably familiar with, like uh, there's no immutability, there are no types. And at the time, and still, uh, you know, there's a lot of ceremony to, to going on to fix that. Uh, so Facebook, you know, is taking a lot of uh, effort in bringing all those ideas, you know, uh, bringing several ideas from OCaml uh, towards JavaScript. So at the time I had something like, you know, I can just keep on doing this ceremony or I can go straight, straight to the source myself and, you know, start learning OCaml. So that's what I did back then. And of course, you know, I'm coming from the front-end world, I'm coming from React. So the, one of the first things that I did was I brought this uh, idea from React, you know, to OCaml. Like, I want to do the same kind of stuff I want to do there. Uh, so I started experimenting with that. So this is 2015, still before Reason. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I, I was working on that back then, but, you know, this stuff didn't really work out. It didn't, you know, resolve into something. But it was the way how I, you know, how I started. With, uh, with OCaml. Uh, at the same time, or around that time, I also started talking to, to Jordan Bock, of course, of React and Reason fame, and he mentioned that uh, you know, he had made se several, uh, several changes to the syntax of OCaml. And at the time, I had something like, yeah, he's maybe he's going to do like a pull request or something like to OCaml. Um, but of course, then uh, 2060 happened, and Reason got launched. And it was very very similar to what I was doing, uh, but there was like, you know, there was moment, more momentum behind it, and it was better to, at least in my opinion, to, you know, to start helping out there. And uh, one of the great things, you know, if, if something like that happens is uh, it also provides, you know, a bit an opportunity to get access to like really expert people. Uh, so uh, that was really great to start helping out there. Uh, I especially want to thank like, I, from the beginning there, it was, there was like Jung Sin and Jordan who really helped me out with, you know, getting started with, uh, with Reason. Uh, so I started helping out with, with Reason. I did several things on the syntax. Uh, I, you can blame me for JSX, you can blame me for the object notation, and several other things. Um, but at some point, uh, work started, you know, at work started on the new function syntax. And this was, this was quite a big change. And I didn't really want to stress too much into that, so I had something like, I'm not going to do syntax change for, some, for a while, so I'm going to look in for something new. So I decided to d dive into this rabbit hole, uh, this never-ending, this, this, this journey that feels currently like never-ending, the journey of compiling OCaml slash reason to WebAssembly. So, the first question for our rabbit hole is, where are we going to enter this rabbit hole? Or where are we going to change the OCaml compiler? So first we need to understand how it works. So I'm, I'm using here, like I'm saying here OCaml compiler. Uh, you know, we are, we are quite familiar with like BuckleScript. So BuckleScript is like a fork of the OCaml compiler. So most of the times when I mention Buckles, when I mention OCaml here, you know, you could, you know, BuckleScript is using the same thing here. Uh, it, it works the same. Um, so first, we need to understand how the compiler works. So, so we are going to start really simple here. We're going to start at the front end of the compiler. We're going to use this example uh, to understand how it works. Um, so this is our piece of code. We're doing a simple addition here. The first thing that happens uh, what the, part, the first thing that the compiler does, it's uh, the, the code is being lexed. Uh, 
and the code is being uh, changed into the, the sorry, uh, the, the regular the the, the lexer is using regular expressions to turn the code into separate tokens. Next, the parser, which uh, contains like all the possible combinations of tokens, um, um, turns, the, turns the tokens into a uh, graph of actual or camel code, which is called the AST. Uh, yeah, this one. Um, so now for fun, let's look a little bit more at the, the parsing part of uh, how it works for OCaml and both Reason. Uh, this, this, I thought it would be fun to slow, show a little bit of this because um, if you're interested in diving into Reason and helping out, this will at least give you some guidance. So if you have the, the, the Reason parser or the OCaml parser, uh, they both use this MLI format. Uh, which can basically can be can, um, what are basically three sections. The first part here is your camel code, the second part are your tokens, and the third one, or the most interesting one, is the, the productions. So here, uh, what I just said, like the, the possible combinations of your tokens are visible here. So how does that, uh, how does that look like? Um, so if we take our example again that we just had, our simple lead binding with an addition, uh, so what the parser does here, it will first uh, check like, okay, these are the possible combinations, or th th this is like... Um, um, uh, so the parser will first check like, okay, are there like item attributes here? Uh, so it's going to, because it's lowercase, it's going to, going to try to reduce, so it's going to a different section here. It might seem a little bit technical, but it's, it's okay. Uh, and now it goes to like this empty section, empty section because we actually didn't have any item attributes in our in our example. So now it's being shifted. It goes to the it goes to the right, and this goes on until the entire syntax is resolved. So, like I said, uh, this might seem a little bit weird, but uh, you can kind of compare it with uh, with components. So you have components and you have child components. You can think of like uh, this string as like one component. And like the, the lowercase words, you can see, think of them as uh, child components. So it's like JSX, but for syntax in a really large file. Oh, I'm going to be a little bit too quick. So now we have our FSEC syntax tree. Uh, here we still have no idea what our types are. For this, we need to have the, the, the type checker which checks, of course, you know, if everything is what it is, what it is. If it doesn't happen, you know, there's a type error, and if it does, uh, there will be a typed AST. And now we are sure that uh, the arguments that we have are indeed integers. So, uh, to quickly recap, uh, this is the OCaml, this is like the, the, comp the front end of the compiler. Uh, we have our code, uh, the lexer, uh, turns it into tokens, then we have the parser who uh, uh, turns it into the, to an IST, then with the type checker uh, that makes it a typed AST. So. Now, let's take a look at the other part, uh, the backend of the compiler. So here we take our typed AST from the front end and turn it into the first immediate representation called the, the lambda representation. Here is also the place where the code goes from being more readable for humans towards more targeted towards the machine. Um, so the higher level extractions also are removed here for uh, like the modules, objects, you know, they disappear here. Also, the types that we had before are now replaced with the runtime memory model. So actually, it doesn't really matter here anymore what the types are, because we are sure what they are already. Uh, which is, of course, really powerful, because now you don't need to do anything at runtime. So let's take a little bit look, let's take a more uh, detailed look at how the Lambda Intermediate rep representation look like with our example. So here again, we have our simple addition. And below, we have the, 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 the S expression representation of the lambda format, which is kind of looks like this Lispy syntax. The first thing that you will notice is the, the, the additional numbers. The additional numbers are necessary 
because in some cases you can reuse like the, the same uh, variable name, and you don't want them to uh, you, you don't want them to override each other. You want them to be unique. The other one is the, the set global name, the, the set the, the set global construct, and the make block construct. So they get, the set global here uh, with the test. Uh, it defines like the module here, or the it, it creates it, it sets a mo it sets a global. What it says. Uh, and then there's make block, which creates an uh, OCaml, what's called an OCaml value. And here the OCaml value is uh, so we have like this test, and I like the first memory block of test. We are now going to point to this example let binding. Uh, in, in this example, we can still understand what is being written. Uh, but like I mentioned before, if we are going to use like the more more um, uh, the more uh, higher level constructs like objects and um, um, what's the other one? Objects and sorry, I forgot. But when we are going to use the, those ones, it will be more difficult uh, to understand. So now we are at the part where the Ocoma compiler makes uh, a decision where, uh, where you can go either like from the bytecode path or the native path. So let's take first take a look, uh, look at the, the uh, that, uh, bytecode. So here we have our lambda intermediate representation, which is translated into bytecode, which is mostly like this binary representation of the lambda format, uh, which itself runs in uh, OCaml run. Now let's take a look at the, the native uh, the native part. Here we are going from the lambda intermediate representation to the CMM or C minus minus intermediate representation. So this is called also called the, the second intermediate representation, and it's also the last machine independent representation of our code. Everything below here, which is which I grayed out, uh, are tests that being happened because they are specific to a certain CPU. Uh, so to clarify uh, CMM a bit more, uh, here at CMM it becomes more clear like what code is like um, what values are being allocated on the heap. It, becomes, it also becomes clear what our memory representation of the code that we have is looking like. So to summarize the compiler backend, uh, we went from our typed AST, we translated it to the first intermediate representation, so the lambda intermediate representation. We then have two options. We can either go towards bytecode or the, the C minus minus intermediate representation, which then uh, can be translated uh, towards the CPU specific code. All right, we now have covered uh, the basics of the OCaml compiler. So let's take a look at WebAssembly itself. Uh, there's a lot of potential for WebAssembly, but if you would ask me from how it's going to look like in the future, uh, I have, to be honest, I still have no idea. You know, there's the promise there, but how it's actually going to look like, uh, it's, it's still taking shape. Uh, and also with the work that we're doing on WebAssembly uh, uh, to add it to OCaml and slash reason, is to future-proof to, to future both of them. So, uh, what, does, uh, web, 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 what, what are the features of WebAssembly? Uh, we're calling it WebAssembly, but you could probably better call it something like op open bytecode, because it's, it's not really assembly, it's more a bytecode. And you can run it on the web, but you can actually run it anywhere. It, it's not limited to the web. Uh, it's also a limited set of instructions. Uh, like the the whole specification uh, fits on a sp fits on like a single sheet, which is uh, if you're into that really interesting. And a really important one is uh, security. So with WebAssembly, you will have no access to the stack, and this is important. But I will tell you that later on. Or later on. And the fourth one is linear memory or memory uh, or the. Uh, linear memory, which requires to, you to do manual memory, man memory management. There is no garbage collection going on. So one interesting thing is, 
the spec, and the, the WebAssembly rep spec implementation is written in our camel. So this is uh, really helpful for, our, for us. Um, so now let's take a look at how our simple example would look like if we would write it directly within WebAssembly. So this, um, so the big question here is, how are we going to go from our example to this WebAssembly code? Now, I just explained the OCaml compiler. I just explained the, um, the, the WebAssembly important parts there. So let's take a look at the possible entry points here. So there are three possible entry points that we can take. We can go with, uh, we, we can use, the, we can start at the Lambda layer. So the first intermediate representation, uh, mostly similar to what, what BuckerScript does. BuckerScript does a bit more, but mostly it starts there from what I understand. Uh, the bytecode format, it's also something we could, we could consider. Um, and there's the C minus minus one, uh, where the big advantage of C minus minus is that we know how our memory is going to look like. Uh, to be honest, when I had this question and when I was figuring it out, I had no idea. I had no idea if I needed to do one or the other um, initially, I had an idea to, uh, to do somewhat similar to what JSON for Camel is doing. Um, but I then basically asked, from, OK, is this a good approach? And then Mark Shinwell from uh, Jane Street mentioned to me, like, OK, you should go with C minus minus. So that's what I did. I went with C minus minus. So C minus minus is the closest to what we want to have when compiling to WebAssembly. But it makes certain assumptions about its. Uh, it makes certain assumptions that are not available in WebAssembly, and these are garbage collection, exception handling, and tail calls. And as you notice, or might notice, um, they are all related to the stack. So now let's take a little bit more. Let's dive a little bit deeper into uh, this, this challenge here. So this is my really nice uh, keynote uh, art. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we need to be understand a bit better how memory works. So let's take a look at the stack. Now, the stack works like this. Uh, you enter a function, it's, it's pushed on the stack. You leave a function, it's popped off from the stack. And, you know, the, the, your function on the stack, it has pointers. You know, it has these pointers towards the memories that are in use on the heap. And this, this is important. Um, but we don't have access to the heap. You know, um, it's why don't we have access to? Uh, oh, sorry, stack. We don't have access to the stack, and why don't we have access to the stack? Is is if we had access to the stack, uh, we could uh, change how our code is executing, and that is not something we want, and especially not on the web. So now let's take a look again at our three um, at our three main challenges. Uh, for regard regarding the stack. Uh, so for garbage collection, you need to understand what's in use of the heap. Uh, you need to know which function is still using uh, which, which, which memory block. For exception handling, you want to be able to, uh, to jump in the stack. Uh, so um, you, want to jump, you want to jump down in the stack. Um, otherwise, for, no, for, for example, you know, you throw some, somewhere an exception and then several functions up, it needs to be catched. So you need to, you need to be able to jump there. The third one is tail calls. So what you do with tail calls is you are reusing the last stack frame. And um, like, yeah, you need access for the stack for that again. So the challenges for compiling OCaml to WebAssembly, they basically come down to there's no access to the stack. The needed constructs that we, the constructs that we need are also not there. Uh, but luckily, they are coming. Work is being done to basically solve all these challenges. So this, what I just described, is basically the rabbit hole that I'm, quite, that I'm currently in. That I'm currently in. And nine months ago, 
I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. You know, nine months ago, I did not have this knowledge. I did not know anything about CMM. I didn't know anything about WebAssembly. Uh, all I had was there, there was this great, there was this opportunity there from for me to you know to start hacking into it and to just dive into it. Um, Initially, it was really just me asking questions, and questions, and more questions, and trying to, uh, you know, trying to figure this out. Uh, it was a really deep dive, and at various mo moments, it was pretty strenuous. You know, I was really, really blocked for 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 days sometimes. Do not, not I was really heads in deep, uh, and sometimes, you know, I went for like I, I did the complete wrong thing. But luckily, uh, more people are getting uh, at, more people are now getting involved in uh, trying to make this happen, and that's really exciting because uh, making this happen, uh, it, it's it's not something that I want to do alone. I really think it's important to get multiple people involved to actually make this happen. Uh, so people from Mozilla, Jane Strip, or Camel Labs, and Facebook uh, are really uh, starting to help out with this. And the great thing is now, I can share my rabbit hole with others. So, really fun. So, the current status of my work, uh, I'm able to compile C minus minus to WebAssembly. Uh, I'm able to link object files together. Uh, so, object files, you can see them, you can think of them as kind of like, like, like library files. And linking, you can think of it like uh, if you have Webpack or you're bundling. But then it's called you know, like in, where you do when you work on native, it's called linking. But, uh, so I can compile like really really basic OCaml applications to WebAssembly. Uh, so it's it's not really interesting to show that. So that's why I don't have a demo. Uh, I, I can show you an addition, but yeah, it's, it's no, nothing like you haven't seen it before. Uh, the things that I still need to do, or that we still need to do. Um, my current code base, I'm going to be honest, there was a lot of exploratory coding there. Uh, like I mentioned, I didn't know what I was doing, and I was figuring things out along the way. So I really need to clean up the code and refactor. Luckily, it's in OrCaml, so that's not bad. Um, to make sure that the stuff that I did is actually correct, and there will be bugs there, I'm pretty sure of that. I need to connect it to the, the OrCaml test suite. Uh, a large part of this talk, uh, when I was talking about memory, is actually about the OCaml runtime. Uh, that also needs to be sorted out. Um, still needs to be sorted out. Uh, getting, it up, getting it upstream uh, is also a challenge. I have totally no idea where, uh, where that will end. Um, so basically, I have no idea where this rabbit hole ends. It is this endless journey that goes on and on and on. This thread hasn't stopped yet. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, my name is uh, Sander Spice. This was my rabbit hole uh, that I'm currently in. Um, like, like one, one thing that I find really important, you know, it's uh, what, what Cheng also mentioned before. Uh, find yourself a mentor, you know, uh, you know, to try to try to, uh, to try to communicate with people, try to do stuff together. Um, you know, we are the ones that actually decide where reason is going towards, uh, and we we have you know we have the power to shape it. So we should. Thank you. <laughs>